on, let's give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, you can stay standing real quick, and we're going to just open up the word and get into it. But I, as I mentioned to the first service, um, that first of all, it's an honor to be here, always an honor to be here with you guys and love, love you, love your church, love your pastors. Do you have the greatest pastors in the world, right? They're fantastic. And, um, but over the last few, few months and, and up, up and leading to these weeks, um, I've really felt like God was moving me from vision to burden. And a vision is always birthed out of a burden. You got to have a burden for something in order to endure. And the Lord really began to speak to me and show me things that, um, and yet people have a lot of questions, what's happening today? And then people want to know, what do I need to do? And so a few weeks ago, I was in prayer. The Lord spoke to me and he says, I'm going to give you a word but it's not just for your church, it's for the church. And I've been taking time away from not preaching in other churches except just for my close friends because I have a business and, and it's in its prime state right now. And it takes that, that other focus. And yet today, I say that because this word I'm gonna give you today it, 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 I believe you're going to walk out going, I know what to do. I know what to do during this time right now. Open up your Bibles if you can, your iPhones, iPads, whatever you have. This new generation got everything. Joel chapter 2, it's a prophetic chapter speaking of the time in which we're living in today. He says, gather the people sanctify the congregation assemble the elders and gather the children in nursing babes let the bridegroom come out of his chamber and the bride from her dressing room i believe our our dress rehearsal is is done and the big wedding is on its way i want to speak to you a message i've entitled let the floodgates open Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation and give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray, give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all the people that slept in to come to the late service say, amen. amen. You may be seated today in Jesus' name. I really believe that we are living in truly a prophetic time. Like most of you that were probably been in church for a while, and for those of you that have been raised in church, you've heard the term, we're living in the last days, and you got to get ready because Jesus is coming. And I remember being a young boy in church in those wooden pews. Today, you got comfortable seats. Say amen to that, right? And I would hear the pastor saying, we're living in the last days. you got to get right with God and all these type of things. And, and even going to seminary. You know, we're living in the last days. We're living in the last days. And, and I think that we have been living in the last days because we're in that 2,000th year going into the third day. The Bible says as a day in heaven is a 1,000 years on earth. And so we know that we are living in the last days according to Matthew 24, according to Luke 21, and according to Revelation chapter 2. But... Today, there's something different because the day in which we're living in right now, for the very first time, we are seeing Ezekiel 38 and 39 being fulfilled. And the Bible gives us these accounts not to scare us, but to prepare us. The Bible says in Joel 2.31, it says, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And what Joel was seeing was that there was going to be a time on the earth in which there will be darkness on every continent, meaning that sin would be at its height. 
that possibly there would be wars on all fronts. Matter of fact, the, the scriptures are so specific that even in Revelation chapter 19, it says that, and the whole world will see when Jesus chains the devil and throws him into the pit forever. Well, how can the whole world see if there weren't satellites? So the Bible is descriptive about the day in which we're living in. And it says that these days are going to get darker and darker and darker. And what we're watching today is that the world is getting darker and darker and darker. What the Bible says is right uh, uh, what the Bible says is wrong, the world's saying it's right. Because the Bible talks about that in the last days, the hearts of people will grow cold. In other words, they'll be numb. They'll, this will just be the norm in some degree. But yet, it is a sign in which God is saying, I'm preparing the church for such a time as this. And so I want to show you as I unfold this prophetic word to you for alignment and position because the reason why God gives us insight and the reason why God gives us foresight and the reason why 70% of your Bible is prophecy is that it is all about positioning and posturing you for what God's about to do next. So when you see this timeline, you will see this. If you can put the timeline up, it says this. It, it, it begins with, and I started it with Jesus being born. Why? Because the entire Old Testament is about this one day. It is about this Messiah will be born as the second Adam, the son of God, and he would redeem all of mankind. And so he was born of a virgin named Mary. And then all of a sudden you see the fact that Jesus now is with his disciples for three and a half years. You say, well, Obed, how do we know that? The evidence that Jesus was with his disciples for three and a half years is the fact that today we have the gospels and we have the epistles. So that is the proof and evidence that these men spent time with Jesus. And so now that we know that Jesus spent three and a half years with the disciples, the Bible says that he told his disciples to go to the upper room and I'm going to send another and he's the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what you have to understand about God and throughout the Bible, that God always is preparing you and speaking to you about your future. Your adversary, the devil, is always speaking to you about your past. See, the thing is, is that you know where someone's attention is, is by what comes out their mouth. So if God is looking at your future, it's evident that he's always speaking to you about your future. The enemy is never looking at your future because he's always speaking to you about your past. So what you got to realize is that all throughout the Bible, God always had his people looking to the future. Why? Because God simultaneously works on you in the now for the next. Which means that he's always preparing you for what he already has prepared for you. Let, let me break this down. God was preparing Moses while he was in Egypt. Now, because what God had next was that God would use Moses to come back and tell Egypt to let my people go. Come on, am I talking to somebody? So God is always working on you now for what you have next. And the next is always there. God didn't deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt unless he would have showed them that there was a land flowing with milk and honey. How many know the land was already flowing with milk and honey before the children of Israel ever even came out of Egypt? Am I talking to somebody? So, so here's what you got to realize. God is always in your future as he's still in your present right now. So God, through Jesus, tells his disciples. Now imagine Jesus picking you and you're one of his 12. And like two months later, he's like, hey, I just want you to know I'm going to be leaving you guys. And you're like, what are you talking about? You just, you just, we just dropped our nets. We gave up everything. And you, no, no, no. I'm preparing you for what I have prepared for you. 
So the disciples are with Jesus for three and a half years, not because they need it. They need to be prepared. You don't have what you have yet because you're still in preparation. Don't you remember when Jesus says, those who reject John have rejected me. Why? Because John's job was to prepare the way of the Lord. John is Mr. Preparation. But one day, John, Mr. Preparation, looks up and says, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. That's manifestation. It was the first time that preparation saw manifestation. See, that's why Jesus stood up and says, those that reject John have rejected me because he's basically saying, those who reject preparation will miss out on their manifestation. So stop complaining about where you're at right now. Because at the end of the day, you're not where you're at right now just to sit there. It's not your destiny. It's your place of preparation right now for what God's preparing you for. Come on, can I get a witness, somebody? So... Can I teach and preach today? So Jesus is always telling disciples, I'm going to leave you. 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 When I'm gone, when I'm gone, what is he doing? He's pointing them to the future. So Jesus dies, as he said, resurrects, as he says, reappears, as he says. And then what does he tell his disciples? Go to the upper room and wait. Future. For I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And in the book of Acts, put the graph back up. In the book of Acts, you see the fact that in the book of Acts is Pentecost. It's when the Holy Spirit fell and the church, the New Testament church was birthed. You say, Pastor Robert, how do we, how do we know that Pentecost took place? You wouldn't even be here right now. The fact that we are having church today is the evidence that the Holy Spirit fell at the day of Pentecost because it was the birthing of the New Testament church. So you cannot deny his birth. You cannot deny the fact that he was with his disciples for three and a half years because you have the evidence, which is the gospels and the epistles. You cannot deny the fact that the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost because if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't be worshiping today as a church. So if those were fulfilled and now we're in 2023 years in the church age, what's the next thing? Come on, what's the next thing? Come on, say it like you've slept in this morning, had three cups of coffee. What's the next thing? I said, what's the next thing? So if the rapture is next, what do you think God's preparing you for? He ain't preparing you to chill here on earth. He's getting you ready and your family ready, come on somebody, for his return. But there's all kinds of stuff that gotta take place. Cause there's always drama before the wedding. Come on somebody. And the Bible is one big wedding story. And so what you got to realize is that God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. But, and, and so what's happening is, is that as God is preparing you now for what's next, God is preparing the church even though the world is going through chaos right now. He tells us, which I'm going to show it to you, I'm going to show you down to the details that there's going to be wars and here's what's going to happen. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. It's going to, who, this is who it's going to be. He gives it all to you, not to scare you, but to prepare you and position you so that when it's time, the church is ready to shine because the church is the light of the world and the darker the world gets, come on, the brighter the church gets in Jesus' name. Why? Because light is at its best in darkness. So what are you afraid of? Oh, well, you don't understand. No, 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 no. You're going to see it. But look, 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 what, look what God tells John about the last days. John says this. He says this. Look at John 14. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. That word, that actual trouble means don't fall into fear. Don't get scared. You're a covenant child of God. Famine isn't going to touch you. Man, you missed a big amen on that one. Well, Pastor Obed, what about the mark of the beast? You ain't going to be here. I, 
I need to get I, I need to get down here right now. Can I teach from right here? Look it. Rev, we're living within Revelation chapter two through four right now. It's not till Revelation six and Revelation nineteen that you have all the dragons and all this kind of stuff that most folks don't understand. So they said, Pastor Robert, when are you going to teach on that? I said, why do I need to teach on that? You ain't going to be here. Why am I going to tell you about something you don't plan on being? Well, I'm going to take the, are we going to take, you ain't going to take no mark. Because what people get confused, put the graph back up. Look at me, I look dark. Look at, look at, put the graph back up. What's next? I said, what's next? Come on, what's next? And then you have the Antichrist, then you have the second coming. What people get confused is the rapture and the second coming. When Jesus comes back, it's for the church. When the second coming takes place, it means we come in with him. Hello, somebody. So what you got to realize is that God is preparing you, and he says, don't be troubled. Why is he saying don't be troubled? Because he knows that you know you don't have to. Matter of fact, he says this is what you're supposed to do in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. He says, and the good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end's going to come. So if the rapture is next, God is preparing the church to take as many people as he can. Which means your family, come on somebody, your friends, your city. And I'm going to show you, when the last day revival takes place, it will be a day of revival that the world has never seen. And so you're not buying a building just for yourself. You're buying a building because you believe that according to the word of the Lord, you're about to receive the greatest revival. Come on, the world has ever seen. So, let me show you three arenas that I want to show you really quick about prophecy. And then I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you what's happening. And then I'm going to end it on what you're supposed to do. Come on, say amen. Amen. Say thank you. All right, here it is. The first is the arena of prophecy, the arena, the, the arena of prophecy, the arena of Israel, excuse me, the arena of Israel. Israel is always the focus point of prophecy. Why is Israel always the focus point of prophecy? Everyone said, well, they're the apple of God's eye. Yes. Well, they're God's chosen line. Yes. But let me just give it to you in layman term. Can I just give it to you and come on, we just chilling at the park. Come on, we had a coffee shop. I don't want to give you some theology. Let me just give you some coffee shop talk. So imagine today you live in this house. You have enough money now that you're building your dream home. I mean, you building that dream home and you're going to spend the rest of your life there. If I was your enemy, what home would I attack? I wouldn't attack the home you're in. I would attack the home that you dream of spending the rest of your life there. The reason why Israel is always the focus point of prophecy is because it's where you and I, the new Jerusalem, are going to stay the rest of our lives. So the enemy understands that this is where we're returning. So this is why there's always an attack against Israel because it's, it's not just about Israel because remember, it's not just about the Israelites. It's also about the Gentiles because we are also part of the covenant of Abraham. We have the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's our homes. So according to, according, according to Matthew 24, Luke chapter, Luke chapter 21 and Revelation chapter 2, it's Israel, but this is, what, this is my concern right now. And this is why I'm saying, and I could prove to you, and I'm going to prove to you in the next five minutes, why the clock is ticking. And that is because the next arena is the arena of global alignment. What we have always seen is Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Revelations 2. We've been seeing that for decades but it's only till recent that we are seeing Ezekiel 38 and 39 being fulfilled, and that's global alignment. The Bible says this, watch this, in Ezekiel chapter 38, 
Verse two, it says, son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against them. Now, you say, what are all those names? Well, let me give you those names. Those names are Gog is modern day China. Magog is the northern region. This is where Israel is, and all these sit above it called the northern region. And then you have Tubal, which is Turkey. You have Meshech, which is modern-day Moscow. And then you got the Prince of Rosh, which is Russia. Hear what I'm saying to you today, and then I'm going to show you what you have to do to be positioned as the church and why this ain't going to affect you. And that is... That people think today it's about Hezbollah, it's about Hamas, and it's about Iran. Those are all distractions. Because anytime the devil does his real work, he always sends an illusion to put your eyes over here while he's working over here. So let me prove it to you in just natural terms. If you have Israel here, next to it is Lebanon. It cannot be Lebanon because at the end of the day, Lebanon sits at 146 in military force. Israel is number 11. It cannot be Syria because Syria sits at 111 and Israel is number 11. But here's where it starts to get. The next above it is Turkey. Turkey's number eight and Israel's 11. But we know it's not Turkey because according to Ezekiel 38, they join with who? With Russia. And who's at the top? Russia. They're number three. All these years, Russia has been strong because of its industrial. But it's never had innovation. And you're starting to see the merge of China and Russia coming together. Because China down gives Russia the innovation along with the industrial to merge all these nations in which they will need in order to all of them come against Israel. But the Bible says when that day comes, the spirit of God's gonna raise a standard up against it because God's people and God's country, come on somebody, cannot be wiped away. And the reason why it cannot be wiped away is because that's our future. And that's where we will spend eternity at. So you're starting to see these global alignments take place. All trying to come against one place. Not because God loves Israel more than he loves us. It's because it's our final destination. Oh, I can go so much deeper. So, you have the arena of of, of Israel, the arena of global alignment, and we're seeing it. And then the next arena is the arena in which the gospel shall be preached. Why do you think, probably more than ever before, the gospel needs to be preached around the world? It's because what's next? I said, what's next? God doesn't want to leave anyone behind. And so as God, as I showed you the three arenas of prophecy taking place today, let me give you three arenas that I believe God's gonna do during this time. The first is there's gonna be an awakening. Get ready, there's gonna be an awakening. And that awakening is gonna be your family. Let me tell you why it's gonna be your family. Because Acts 16, 31 says, if one is saved, the entire household is saved. But let me tell you why. Because dark times raise curiosity. And what's going to happen is, is that you're going to be walking around with a big old smile on your face. You're going to be, you're going to be feasting in the midst of famine. And you're going to have the joy of the Lord. And you're going to have a skip in your step and all this kind of stuff. 
and your family's going to sit there and say, why are you so happy? Don't you see everything that's going on in the world? And you're going to say, I've been knowing about this for 2,000 years because the Lord already showed me and he prepared me for such a time as this. Well, aren't you scared? What am I scared of? I ain't going to be here when it happens, and neither can you if you give your life to Jesus. Come on, you won't have to worry about it. Come on, am I talking to somebody? So there's going to be an awakening in your family because God's going to visit your family because he knows you've been praying for them, you've been standing for them, you've been believing for them. And now watch this, now watch this. If every one of your family members, when they get saved, they wouldn't fit in this building. So the fact that God is preparing you now for what he's prepared for you next is there's a reason why you're moving into a bigger building because there gotta be a place where the harvest comes. See, I told my church this. Boy, I feel the anointing of God. I told my church this. We can't be a soul winning church and not be into buying buildings. It don't work. But if there's a severe famine coming and we're about to see the greatest economic, economic collapse, and the reason why you're going to see an economic collapse is not to scare you. Please tell me, I'm not going to scare you. But the economy is ran on three sectors. Industrial, finance, industrial, Finance, and there's another one. I just went blank. All of these, energy, industrial, energy, finance. For the very first time, all of these sectors will be joined together by AI. It's the way the Antichrist can control it. And we saw the dress rehearsal during COVID. Oh, you don't want to take the shot? Well, shut your bank account down. Just like that. Oh, you know what? You don't want, you don't want, you, you don't want to stay in, you, you, you want to go out there and do anything? You're going to, we're going to shut every store down, every place down. You're going to stay in your house and you ain't coming out. Just like that. If you think, if you think COVID was tough, just wait till the Antichrist gets control. But you say, Pastor Obed, I'm scared. No, no, you ain't going to be here. I say, you ain't going to be here. So watch this. There's, I got to hurry up. There's going to be an awakening of your family. Then there's going to be an outpouring of your finances. Oh, I'm glad. I, I'm glad I got some folks that are excited about that. And I'm, I'm going to show it to you. For you business people, boy, this is going to be your best service you ever attended. Because I'm going to tell you, you're going to see it prophetically. What God's doing. And then, not only is there going to be an awakening in your family and outpouring in your finances, there is going to be a revival in your community. But notice how God works. I'm going to visit your family. I'm going to prosper your life. And then we'll have enough to take the city. God is preparing you now for what he has for you next. Now let me prove it to you. Joel chapter two. Here's what he says. For I, meaning God, will restore the years that the locust and the canker worm have stolen. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Pastor Obey, you, you're, you, you just said we're not gonna be touched by famine. So why would God have to restore? No, 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 God's not talking about that. If you study it, he's not, you know what he's talking about? When you were in Egypt, all your addiction, all of your sin, it is all going to be returned back to you. You say, come on, Obed. If Egypt and the way God delivered the children out of Egypt was a foreshadow on how he delivers us, 
Egypt, I mean, the children of Israel walked out of Egypt with the gold and the silver. Why? Because everything they were enslaved and everything they created for Pharaoh, God made him return it back to them seven times greater. And I'm here to prophesy, you may have lost money, you may have lost credit to your addiction, but God took record of it and he's telling the devil, you got to return it back to my people in Jesus' name. Now watch. So then he says, and afterwards, read it, afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'll restore everything you've lost. No, no, I'm going to restore everything you lost. Then afterwards, I'm going to pour out my spirit. I'm going to receive, you are going to be so blessed. I said, you're going to be so blessed in the midst of famine that your boss is going to come up to you and say, the Lord woke me up. I don't even serve him, but he told me I need to give you a raise. And you're going to sit there and say, well, because I'm a covenant child of God. And at the end of the day, this is a promise God has me. You're going to have clients that wouldn't give you the time and day and they're going to pick up the phone because the Lord's going to bring them back to their, bring you up to their minds and they're going to call you instead of somebody else because at the end of the day, that belongs to you. Watch. He says, I'll restore then afterwards. Then afterwards. Then afterwards which means there has to be a revival of resources before there's a revival of souls, which means God has to transfer the resources before he transferred the souls. Because how can the church afford another 50,000 people in their church? How can we have more kids in kids ministry if we don't have buildings? So God in the last days is going to purposely bless you so much because he's going to make you a conduit. You are an extension of heaven on earth. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. And when you sit there and say, God, use me, God's going to say, watch what I'm about to do. I'm about to bless you. Now, I feel God right now. Some of you don't believe me. I, I sense it. So I'm going to prove it to you. Give me the next verse. Put it on the screen. Can I just teach? I got two more minutes. Look what the Bible says. In Ezekiel chapter 38, 30, 30, 34. This is right before Ezekiel 38, 39. Right before. I will make you, meaning God, and them, I will make them in the places, watch this, all around my heel a blessing and I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Okay, now let me show you what it means in the original writing in the Hebrew. It means this, put that up. It means this, shower of blessings in the Hebrew means to pour down, rain upon violently. In the English, it means the clouds in thick succession and great and large quantities. Have you ever been saturated by the rain to the point that everything was dripping and everywhere you went, you look back and you saw the trace of the fact. Can I tell you what kind of blessings are coming about? What kind of blessings are coming by the church? You're going to be so saturated with God's blessing. You show up to your aunt's house, she gets blessed. You show up to your grandma's house, she gets blessed. You show up to your job, they get blessed. Why? Because the blessing's on you in Jesus' name. Woo! All right, I got to get to Irvine. I'm going to give you three things you need to do. I proved it to you prophetically. What's happening? It's not by accident that our Secretary of State last week went to Turkey. 
landed and the president decided not to meet him. It's not by accident that the first time ever, last month the president of Turkey warned Israel, which has always been a friend, the global alignment's taking place. Famine's coming, but feasting's gonna happen to the body of Christ. Are you hearing me? Really quick, three things. Pastor Obed, what do I need to do right now? Right now, right here. For everyone, everywhere. What do I need to do? The first thing you need to position yourself spiritually. Let me just say this. As loving as I can, stop playing church. That simple. You're either in or you're out. You're either hot or you're cold. You won't survive. You won't. At all. You won't survive. It's going to be too, too strong. You're not going to live, you're not going to be able to live in both worlds. You can't coexist. It's not going to happen. You need to get right with God. The second thing is you need to position yourself relationally. Let me come here. Because, because faith works by love. And some of you have been sitting there saying, but Pastor Ben, I got faith. I've been serving. I've been in the church. I just haven't had breakthrough. You don't have a faith problem. You have a love problem. My brother graduated from USC with a doctorate in pharmacology and was compound pharmacist, mixing all the drugs in the hospitals for specialty patients. And my brother had this proving thing from my dad, had bitterness towards him. The more successful my brother began, the harder he became towards my father. And my brother landed up getting in trouble, making drugs for himself. He was so good at his addiction because it's what he did. You never knew it. And a few years ago, my brother hits rock bottom calls me one day. He says, can you pick me up and take me to the hotel? I found him under a bridge. I said, Anthony, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to a rehab. He said, I'm not going. I said, no, 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 you don't have a choice. You're going to have to beat me up in this place, in my car right now. I'm taking you to a rehab. He says, all right, then take me to McDonald's first. So I, I, I take him to a rehab. The CEO, they all go to my church. Pastor, I said, no, 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 no. I'm not here as a pastor. I'm here as a brother. My brother goes through the treatments. We go visit him. He tells us, I need to go see dad. get my breakthrough until I forgive him. My dad was on his deathbed. And they allowed us to take him. And my brother walks in the room and my dad hears his voice. He hadn't heard it in years. And he smiles the best he can and brother said, Dad, I've never lost faith. I just wasn't walking in love. And that's why faith hasn't worked for me. Faith working through love. And Dad, if I'm going to stay free, I need to forgive you. 
dad, you could see his eyes and tears come down his eyes and his words were, son, I can go home now. You see, I can't stop you. You couldn't stop that person you trusted. You trusted that person. You believed them. And you had every right to. You opened your heart. But you can't remain a prisoner of your past and still punish your future. You don't have to trust them. You don't even got to like them. He just says, forgive them. There's a lot of people I've forgiven. I still don't like. And if I see him at Walmart, I, I just go a different direction. But he says, Obed, you don't have to trust them. You don't have to like them. You just got to forgive them. Because here's why. To forgive is to set a prisoner free. And discover all along that that prisoner was you. It was you. You can't go back and change the past. But you can start now and change the end. Come on, are you hearing me? So you got to you got to position yourself spiritually. I'm all in. You got to position yourself relationally. Ain't no one's dysfunction going to mess up my function. I could be around a lot of messed up folks, but I choose not to be messed up. I could be around a lot of people that hurt me, but at the end of the day, I'm going to stop bleeding on those who didn't cut me. And then, number three, you got to position yourself financially. What does that mean? God hears my hands. Will you trust them? You promise that there'll be an outpouring. You promise there'll be a transfer. You promised, here's my hands. Friends, show him that you that he can trust you what he's already placed there. And then get ready for the more that he has in store for you. Listen. Listen. You ain't gonna give your child $20 if they can't handle five. You wouldn't be a good parent. My son comes to me, Dad, I wanna buy this sweatshirt. I go, how much? $60. I'm like, we better go to the thrift store. <laughs> so I took him to a thrift store. This was two years ago. Bought him a sweatshirt. Went in his room. Checked. It was folded. He wore it. Washed it. Folded it. I bought him a pair of sneakers. They're in the box. Now when my son comes to me, Daddy, I want these new pair of Jordans. Sure. Just send them to me. I'm going to buy them. You want to know why? He showed me I can trust him. Come on, are you hearing me? Your hands are anointed. I said your hands are anointed. I said your hands are anointed. And God's about to prosper your hands. Come on, he's preparing you. He's positioning you. Freedom House. Your best days are ahead of you. Your worst days are behind you. The devil is afraid of you. It's why he's attacking you. But greater is he that's inside of you than he that's in the world in Jesus' name. Come on, let's stand our feet and give God a praise right now. I got to get going. All right, lift your hands. They say in Irvine, Irvine, Irvine. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get to Irvine. Did you get something today? Yeah. We're going to go through an election year. 
There's going to be all kinds of stuff. Don't worry about it. They're going to say this. They're going to say that. They're going to say this. Don't worry about it. You go to the Bible. It already tells us what the future is going to look like. Democrats, Republicans have nothing to do with our future. The only thing they, the only control they have is they either slow it down or speed it up. That's it. Who controls our future is the one who holds it in his hands. So don't be shocked. Don't be shocked, don't be surprised, and don't be troubled. Well, the economy's getting worse for everybody else. Wow, the world's getting darker for everybody else. Not for me and my household. We already gonna serve the Lord. I told my, I told my business team, we're seeing miracles right now crazy miracles and they're like man this is unusual I said no it's not because we wrote in our covenant bylaws that we're going to give 10% of all of our profits to nonprofits. God trusts us he knows where to place it he told Peter go to the fish and in it you'll find in the mouth a gold coin you want to know how many fish there are? <laughs> God knows where your abundance is. Stop worrying. Trust him. Be excited. You're about to move into a new building. Because when you build God's house, he builds your house. Amen. I said amen. You're, you're, you're building it for your family, your friends, your community. And then God says, I'm about to bless you. You're going to be dripping. So that means you're going to have drip. You're going to have some drip on. But your drip is because of your dripping. I'm dripping with blessings. I was tripping and now I'm dripping in Jesus' name, right? Come on, lift them hands. Say, Jesus, these hands are anointed. Thank you. For trusting these hands thank you for positioning me for such a time as this you chose me so now you're equipping me for now and what's next I thank you that these hands are favored these hands are blessed these hands are skilled whatever I lay my hands on shall prosper the sick shall be healed these hands are full of promotions and skill because they're anointed in the name of Jesus I receive the blessing of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit right now right here for everyone and everywhere in Jesus name and give God a praise right now. Thanks so much for watching our service at Freedom House OC. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It's always my honor, my wife's honor to bring you God's word. And I know that God's best is in your future. Make sure to share, uh, click the bell icon so you're always up to date when new content comes out because we want to be a blessing to your life. We want this channel to be a channel that feeds your future and leads you closer to God. Hey, we love you. God bless.